This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. Um, I would say it's probably quite eclectic, um, which I think is just my taste generally. So it's it's a mishmash of, you know, I hop around from sort of um, rock to, you know, <laughs> jazz kind of ish. Um, yes, yeah, so it's eclectic. I would say. And what is your earliest musical memory? My earliest musical memory, um, I would say it's probably my mum playing, you know, Motown or or something at home or like it, it had to be that. I don't, I didn't ever go to concerts or anything when I was younger, but my mum would always play music really loudly in the house, um, still does. Like sometimes she'll wake up really early on a Saturday and then just pumps out music so that's it it's just listening to music insanely loud in the house and today like how big a part does it play of your life music I would say it plays a big part but I always describe myself as someone who's musically illiterate in that I know all the songs so if a song comes on I'm like oh my god I love this I can never tell you who sings it so it plays this huge it has this huge presence in my life in this weird way in that it's I love music but I don't necessarily pay so much attention to the creator of music yeah well um, that's the case so yeah, for, it's huge. for loads of it people is. it is that's good to know I feel like so many people are like <laughs> oh yeah and then this is like I've been I went to see George Michael once in concert I was like I don't think I know any George Michael songs and then he came on I was like oh my god this is George Michael <laughs> <laughs> so that's just me in a nutshell when it comes to music but um that must have been amazing where did you see George Michael at Wembley oh it was that was that the concert that they opened Wembley with like um, when they, I think they refurbished Wembley and George Michael was like the first person to play it. Yes, maybe. I don't like know. Like 2007, we... eight, yes. around then? Yes, around then. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I got really, when George Michael passed away, like I, I knew a bit of the Wham stuff and like obviously his big hits, but when he passed away, because it was so tragic, he's such an amazing singer, I just got so obsessed and I was watching loads of that footage from the yeah. concert. That must have been amazing seeing it was, him. It was an amazing concert. Um, yeah, it was incredible. But like I said, I arrived being like, I don't know if I know any. <laughs> and then was like, oh, my God, I, I what am I talking about? I love George Michael. He's the most amazing man that's ever existed. Um, <laughs> and the concert was incredible. It was so good. And there was a lot of inflatables, I think, <laughs> memory serves that came on. Um, but it was great. But yeah, music plays a huge part. And I think it gets... You know, I mean, it creates so many emotions and gets you through life in so many ways. And, you know, and speaking about my taste being quite eclectic, it's if I'm cooking, it's, you know, there's a certain type of music I'm playing versus if you're chilling out and, you know, it just gets you in a in a mood. Yeah, for sure. And in terms of uh, the, you know, obviously the last year or more than a year, everything's changed like before that was going to gigs like a big part of your life yeah you go often? Um, a fair amount I would say yeah uh, yeah actually probably quite a lot um going to gigs and to festivals I think I prefer a f yeah I mean I love a festival it was so fun so it has been and it's weird just not going and seeing live music I do wonder you know kind of going back now to a gig whether it will just feel like I just haven't been in a really long time or it's going to be quite overwhelming because there'll be a lot of people and you're just like mm. um, yeah well yeah. I mean would you would you feel comfortable going to to a gig or to like a you know a theatre performance or whatever yeah I actually I, I mean I think so I feel like obviously by the time those things open up 
every, there's going to be, you know, um, certain protocols in place and stuff. So I'll feel safe. And I do think it will just, I, I went to the cinema, I think it was last week, Monday, when they just first opened up and, and you could only sit on your own. And then the two seats next to you were taking out and you wore a mask the whole time. And it just, it was, it didn't feel like I hadn't been to the cinema in a really long time. But then it kind of did it all in the same breath. Yeah, it feels totally normal, I'm imagining. I don't think yeah. I've been since, but like, you know, my mum was saying, oh, I'm never going to be feel safe enough to go to the cinema ever again. And then she came back from London and was like, oh, I went to see Mamma Mia this weekend. And it's like, <laughs> I thought you were saying you weren't safe enough to go into the cinema. I feel like everybody's going to go yeah. back to normal, but who knows? I mean, what what about like, going to a club on June the whatever it is 21st I think 21st. it is 21st yeah um if that goes ahead I, you, know. you know I don't know if I really went to clubs beforehand <laughs> I mean, so. nor, do, nor do I but theoretically you know if you yeah, were so theoretically so if I did fine. and then I'd probably yeah I mean I feel like by the time those things are opening up you know hopefully the venues have you know, certain protocols in place that you feel safe enough to go in. And I honestly feel like I went, I've been out for dinner a few times since things have started opening up in, in London. And you just sort of kind of snap back into life and forget that you kind of have this weird moment. You're like, hasn't the last year been mental? Like we've all been at home and I we haven't been out for dinner. Now we're out for dinner, but it feels really normal. And then you just kind of forget that there was ever this pandemic and that coronavirus exists and stuff. You're just, it's a very weird. Yeah, I hope that that's the case. But yes. but in terms of like during the pandemic, you know, was it music uh, that like in terms of listening, was it music or was it podcasts that you kind of got through or both? Mm, I think it's a mix. For me, I think it books mainly um reading I read a ton and then it would be podcasts and then also music so I think it just kind of depended on the vibe and what I was doing but how often were you reading most days what were you, yeah. what were you reading fiction or non non-fiction um I would s- probably a lot of non-fiction during that time and did you did you did you like that time I think in between it was great to have um, in terms of like, I didn't have to do things I didn't want to do, like, you know, social engagements. So you're just like, oh, it's so nice to just have this time. But then also just missing it. It was, I think it was a blessing and a curse. It was great to slow down and relax and spend time sort of on my own and read and, you know, the world kind of pausing. But then also there was a little bit of, yeah, okay, I could really just go and sit in a restaurant and have somebody mm. serve me now. It's, a, it's after a few uh, a few days or even a few weeks, it's just like you do just start okay. to miss people and you need that change, even even if it's even if you're kind of like happier to not be in that kind of hectic thick of it every single day and all the engagements or obligations that are a bit of a bore do you reckon that life will change for you after this will you be more selective about the type of stuff that you do yeah I mean I do think it's been a great period of like reflecting and deciding on you know things you want to do and how you're going to spend your time so I'm sure I will but then also who knows it'll probably change now everything's opening up and I'm forgetting (laughs) they'll be like you know, back at it. But yeah, I do think, I think for everybody, there has to have been a moment where they've just really had to look at life and see how they're living because you've been forced to slow down. And it's the only time, you know, in my lifetime that's happened and in many people's lifetimes that's happened. So I I do think, yeah, re-entering the world, you think about things differently and, you know, who you hang out with and stuff. Yeah. And and in terms of like, obviously, social media is quite an important part of what you do, your career. Uh, how have you found that side of things recently? And and in general, how do you like grapple with with that? Because, you know, you've kind of, I guess it's a, you've kind of got to be on it, but there's so many pitfalls with it. How, how do you tell yeah. what's your approach? Um. Yeah, social media is one that I feel like I struggle with a lot because 
there is an element of me that feels like I have to be on there. Um, but I don't know if I necessarily like social media too much. I do think it it's very addictive in terms of, you know, if Instagram or other apps on my phone, I just tend to click on them and scroll. So I have a lot of periods where I delete and I have like a social detox. And so I'll go like 10 days where I don't sort of look on social media. And for me, I think it's hugely beneficial. Um, I think if I didn't feel like I had to have some sort of presence on them, then I probably wouldn't be on social media at all, <laughs> which yeah. is, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, it's great for certain aspects. I mean, even just a second ago, I was looking and scrolling at, you know, now the way that we consume and shop so much also comes from social media. So I was looking at clothing on Instagram. Um, but I do think that the negative sometimes outweigh the positive. Um, but for me, it was such a, I, I didn't get onto social media until so late. So I sort of had a career and then everybody joined social media and I kind of didn't. And then I realized it was such a great tool to have, you know, this outlet and platform for your own voice and sort of image that I wanted to portray versus what was being portrayed of me. So that was kind of why I felt like I had to have it and it is great in so many ways in terms of reaching and having that communication with fans direct contact which also didn't exist before um yeah yeah I mean there are so many good things about it but so the, the fact that you have to be on it do you find yourself like just scrolling at, you know like everybody does just yeah, scrolling yeah. down it and just kind of at what point do you think god like this is just such a waste of time Oh, so many times. I think if you, when you're scrolling and you're there and you're like on it for about five minutes or even longer, and then sometimes you're like in this rabbit hole and you're just like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I looking at my best friend's aunt's cousin, whom I don't know, how have I <laughs> ended up on this person's page and have learned everything about their life? And you're like, yeah. okay, I really need to, I've got to what put this down. But it's, I think it's just so numbing. That's, yeah, I mean, the thing is, it because it would be enjoyable, but it's like, whilst you're doing it, you know that it's a waste of time. So it kind of removes the pleasure. It's a bit like, you know, if you're on a diet and you break it or something and you're just yeah. like trying to enjoy eating a donut or something, but it's just not that great at the time. And so in, in the sense of like being on your, you know, best friend's cousin, like profile that you don't know and stuff, like, have you ever been in a situation where you know, like a friend or a friend of a friend will say something like, oh, I've just been on holiday here or, or I, you know, I work here or do that. And you, you know, you secretly actually already know that because of their social, because of your social media activity. Uh, yeah, for sure. Say. It, definitely that's happened in the past. Yeah. I mean, yeah. do you think that that's, is that a bad thing or is that just everybody? I think that's just everybody now. And it's, you know, it's kind of normal to be like, oh, yeah, I saw that on social media. Oh, yeah, I came across, yeah, like, <laughs> I saw, I came across your page on social media. Um, but it is kind of, it's, it is weird. I have friends that are not on social media, and we always have kind of conversations about it, like how I used to have, you know, you take your disposable camera away, and they get everything printed up, and then take like this whole your pack of pictures around and like oh here was my holiday and now it's just yeah on social media and if your friends aren't on it you're like oh you didn't see my oh you haven't seen my holiday pictures there's kind of you know yeah they kind of get a bit insulted because I tried to do a thing where I just didn't follow anyone for a while just because I thought oh it's nicer to hear about it in person and then they can yes. say oh yeah I've just been to Spain oh I didn't know that they're almost like offended that I haven't you know been stalking them which is yeah. quite a strange situation for our society to be in. But yeah. obviously, you know, you're on social media, you've got a lot of followers, um, and that's because of all the different things that you've done. Now, like I, I was, I'm quite interested, and I'm sure that uh, my listeners would be interested in knowing, you know, what aspect of what you've done means the most to you in terms of like, you know, is it modeling, fashion stuff? Is it being in films? What is the area of your career that you're kind of, most attached to 
Oh, good question. I would say for me, the biggest passion, which is slowly transitioning in, into my career is writing, um, slowly followed by acting and maybe they kind of go hand in hand because the writing came about because of acting so I think that that's the part I'm attached to the most just because it's the most creative and you know I'm it's kind of all me really it's my voice um yeah I would say that probably writing and when when did you first start writing I first started writing when I was 22 and I moved to LA. Um, so I lived in LA for 11 years and then I'm back in England because of the pandemic. Um, and when I moved there, I'd modeled, you know, for various years in England. And I kind of didn't really know how to process it because it was so young when I started, I was 18. And then I'd quit and I'd moved to a foreign country. And I just started writing as like kind of a process, like a catharsis process to deal with everything and like put it on the page and kind of figure it out. And that was really how it all started just from there. Um, and then my manager at the time was like, what have you been doing? And I was like, oh, just sitting in the library and writing. Um, should have been at a nightclub, but it's me in the library typing out stuff. Um, and he was like, well, can you write? I was like, I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm a writer, I don't know. He's like, well, why don't you just try writing something? I'm like, well, um, okay. And that was kind of how it all started really and has developed now into what is slowly becoming a career. And, and in terms of like where people can find your, your, your writing, where can people go to find it? There's not really much. Um, I have two articles that I did for the Huffington Post a long time ago, but really there's not... So much of it, I'm, I'm working on a book, which is, um, I'm still writing, so that has not come out What's yet. the book going to be about? Um, the book is a memoir, um, so it will kind of cover my modelling life. Um, yes, it centres around a certain period of time, which is my teens, and then transitioning to mo into modeling but it has kind of other themes that go on throughout yeah well i mean it's it's gonna be a very interesting book i mean back in the day and i mean you'll know a lot more about this than me so like correct me if i'm wrong but so the the sort you know a lot of the modeling that you did is the type of modeling like things like you know being in fhm lists and modeling for the sun and is that a type of modeling that has kind of been you know, as attitudes to women have got, you know, have got better. Is that a type of modeling that we see less of? And is that something that you're ha like happy about? Like, or do you look back on that time fondly? And yeah, it's, it's a tough question to answer because I think it's very mixed. Um, I do look back on certain aspects of that time fondly. I do look back on certain parts of that time with you know certain different lenses of how I feel like it was a very sad period of my life um and I also think just you know the way that the world is changing and the way we view women and I think just you know coming into that career at 18 um I was sort of very unaware of misogyny and, and sexism and all of these kind of things that now as an adult looking back and reflecting, I do feel like, mm, I so that's why I think it's quite complicated to answer that question because it's just, there's so many threads and it's, it, it's intertwined and it's complex. Um, but that modeling has ceased to exist, kind of. It's sort of made its way to, um, you know, platforms like Instagram or OnlyFans, which I think is is a big one for that kind of glam modeling where it's gone. Um, which I think is, I don't, I'm kind of indifferent to it. I don't know if it's better or worse. I mean, I think mm. the women having their own control of their image is better. Um, yeah. Because I think for me, so, I mean, it, so much of it was, you know, the magazines in control of my image and then usually the interviews 
half of the stuff I haven't even said. Um, <laughs> and it's also Awful. just not, yeah. But then again, I also don't know if I would have modeled if it wasn't for that, because my, how I am in person is very different, I think, than the image that was constructed. So I don't know. I think there's good, there's good parts and bad parts, but I do think that women being in control now um, is better. Yeah. Is, um, so is, is that, that the sort of main issue? And I mean, obviously it's easy to see how you could kind of, on the one hand, feel, well, that kind of launched you into public life and, and, and kind of gave you a career. But then yeah. on the other hand, you know, there, there's the, that kind of issue of, you know, women being objectified in that manner but whether or not that's changed with only fans and you know i don't know like to what extent maybe it's good for society that those kind of magazines have no longer got circulation i mean no magazines get any circulation anymore <laughs> uh, regardless of their content but it's like it, has society really shifted that much in 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 that way like i don't know how much of a crime it is inherently for a, a guy to buy a magazine like that um who knows okay. but but are you in general a fan of the cultural shift and do you think things like only fans are like a brilliant solution is that is that really yeah i don't know i think it's kind it's just so complex um i do think that there's so much in society that needs to change and one of the articles I wrote for the Huffington Post was when page three stopped and it was me questioning these things. It was like, you, you know, a lot of feminists were coming together and there was a no more uh, page three campaign that took place, which was, you know, we don't want page three in the paper any longer, which I agreed with. I was like, it's kind of, it's an outdated concept. But is it also, you know, so much of what I've come up against is that I was viewed in a certain lens and in a certain way as this kind of sexy woman on FA chairman in page three. And then I couldn't be anything else. It was like, okay, so that's who you are. You know, you're you you can't be seen as somebody that wants to be taken seriously in anything. And mm. so what I write about in this piece is just this idea of of women being only seen as one dimensional and that you're sexy, if you're seen as sexy, you're sexy, you can't be seen as smart or, you know, in other, other things. Yeah, well, um, that's, uh, that's actually uh, like the fact that that point seems to be missed entirely is really quite mystifying because it's like, yeah. it is very admirable that attitudes are changing i mean not admirable it's great in every single way but like at the same time isn't it actually pretty misogynistic to sort of say that by participating in things like the sun page three um that you can't do anything else uh, or even just implying that and kind of like blaming you for that culture you know that was an opportunity that you took so so do you, is that something that you've had to face quite a lot and is that kind of what you'd be writing about in in your book yes yes so I mean a lot of the book is is based around that and it's it's me exploring all of these ideas and my own journey you know from that period of time and my opinions then how they've shifted and it is something I mean for me it was you know it was it's kind of a catch-22 my career because it was the catalyst that gave me financial freedom and put me in a position that allowed me to, you know, go and study acting and allowed me this time and finances to do various things I wanted to do and pursue. But because of my career, the things that I wanted to do was sort of shut off. It was, it was hard to make that jump from this image I had it was like oh you can't especially here in England when I wanted to act it was like oh <laughs> oh no 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 you can't do you you've done page three like it's a very close-knit um, community here everybody knows everybody in the acting industry most people I would say come from sort of a certain background um 
And so I, I was very much pigeonholed in this, you know, you can't, oh, unless you're going to act and you're going to be like in some stripper movie and you turn into a zombie and you get killed. It was like, that was all I was capable of being or doing. And so, yeah, it's been, I think that shifted and changed now. Like we're going back, you know, I modeled probably about 15 years ago, which is making me feel really old. Um, <laughs> so I do think that things have shifted, but I think that there's still stuff, there's still, you know, space and things still need to change. Um, but it's definitely for the majority of the rest of my twenties was what I came up against. It was like just not being able to move past my career. But now it's so forgotten and magazines are so buried, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's also in the sense of, yeah, like men might need to revise their attitudes, but sort of the models who appeared in those magazines and publications, they don't necessarily need to revise theirs and they don't need to be on the receiving end of kind of like disrespectful treatment. And perhaps that's kind of a point that that a lot of activists are missing in kind of I mean I don't know to what extent like have you ever felt like condemned for taking part in stuff like that for doing that not really I think it's when the, the kind of no more page three campaign came around the only thing I did feel was that it was also neglecting the women so it was women coming up against you know the corporation which is the sun and it kind of didn't really think about the the woman who was doing it so it was almost like the same thing that was happening it's like oh you're going up against these men who you know put naked women in a newspaper and saying you know as female we don't want to see this but the person like myself the model is just not even part of the conversation weirdly mm. like you're shut out from both sides in that people just are speaking for you <laughs> you're kind of like okay I guess um which then is objectification in its own way weirdly yeah but also it's sort of part of that is an implication that it's a crime to model in that way in the first place and that's kind of like an entirely different conversation because in yeah our culture it's it's not like in the culture of this country and the culture of europe culture of the us it's not a crime it's kind of like i mean I, page three probably you know is outdated as you said yeah. and stuff but it's kind of like you know if you don't want to see an image like that just buy a different news but you know buy buy a different newspaper buy a public yeah. buy a different um magazine um that's kind of like yeah. only fans like you know, if you don't want to go on OnlyFans, then don't go on OnlyFans. Exactly. Yeah. I can understand the argument that it is, you know, a national newspaper and it. Yeah. So you can't avoid it. Whereas now with OnlyFans, you can, you just don't join the website. Whereas with something like The Sun, you are going into a news agents. And when people used to buy newspapers, you would go in and it would be there and and so I kind of, I mean, it's just the bizarrest concept generally how it came about. And I, so, so much of it I've explored and looked at, and especially with writing the book, it's all these questions I ask and, and I don't think it's straightforward. It's not a straightforward, like this should be here and this shouldn't, or, you know, you shouldn't do this and, or you should. It's. It yeah, it's gives. very, very complex. And it's not to say yeah. that like, it's not to say ne that necessarily doing that sort of modeling is a crime at all it's like I, yeah I, I don't think anybody could reasonably suggest that it was but a separate and uh, equally interesting thing that I wanted to ask you about was um, you've just moved back to the UK from LA seems like there's been a mass exodus from LA um, what was life <laughs> like in that city was it quite I mean I've been every time I go I love it but is it quite a difficult kind of fickle type of town um <laughs> I mean, LA has many great aspects to it. It's it's a weird town just generally because it's based around an industry and you don't really go anywhere where there's just, it's people only go there for one, you know, industry. I guess people do move there for other reasons, um, but the majority of people that move there from here have, have gone to 
you know, be part of uh, film and television. Um, I, I love it and hate it simultaneously. Like I, I think the weather's amazing, you know, the beaches are great. There's so much like outdoor activity, like the lifestyle you can have there. Whereas like being in London is very different. Um, I, you know, it took me many, many years to find my group of friends, but I have a really solid group of friends that I would say probably 60% of them are British. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you just find each other, you get out there and you're like, oh, you're British, it's friends. Um, <laughs> And so I think that that's like one of the things that can get you through LA. But my biggest hate of it is the driving. And I don't know how I survived so long having to be in a car at all times. I'm a big walker. Um, I love to walk everywhere. I mean, I even love public transportation and just being in the car, you know, even to go to the store to get something like, oh, I've just run out of water. And then you have to get in the car to go there. It was just very mm. annoying for me yeah because it's, it's not it's one of those places i mean a few places in america are like that but you know where it's like oh just just walk instead you can't really do that it would be a bit like kind of going yeah. onto a motorway or something in in the uk and just trying yeah. to walk along it it's just yes. everything's just so big it's All the so streets big are so big and there's no center so it's very spread out so you really do have to and people don't cycling just like unless you're in like venice or santa monica and you're kind of towards the beach you don't really see people on bikes either so no one really cycles um so just getting around that was the biggest thing for me it was like i i love walking i love, even love cycling i love getting on the tube and just like easily getting around and even just the way that you socially interact whereas like somewhere like london it's like, oh, should we meet up, you know, in Soho? Let's go to this bar when things are normal. And then you could just hop around, start somewhere and then just end up somewhere else. And whereas in L.A., it's very much like you have to plan everything. Like, oh, if we're going to meet here at, at this restaurant, there's no other restaurants near it. So yeah. like you start there and, and then I guess with the integration of Uber kind of change things a little bit, because before that, when I first moved there, it was just taxis and it was really, they were always really hard to get. So you kind of couldn't ever really get around. It was weird. Yeah, you have to go um, to kind of one place for the evening and that's where you're yeah. going to go until you leave. You couldn't do like a bar crawl or something like that. Uh, I mean, it was yes. just a nightmare in LA to do something like that. But also, doesn't exist. what's it like in terms of, because when you, you went there and, you know, you studied acting and you're appearing in things, what's it like trying to make your way there in show business is it like is it a bit of a minefield yes for sure um sorry i think something loud is coming by i don't know what it is oh it's a guy with a on a tractor <laughs> <laughs> i weirdly can't hear it because i get a bit oh that's there. good <laughs> we have a, pe like, we have really a peacock loud. in our garden uh, that's yeah. from like the neighbors they have this big like house and they've got a peacock in their garden the peacock's been screeching throughout this i don't think you've heard it though no no no, i haven't and i don't think the i don't think the podcast this morning heard, heard it because i think yeah because it literally <laughs> just sounds like someone's screaming so yeah i couldn't hear that either i think the zoom filter is like really powerful uh but anyway um, yeah so okay. what was it so, like in la yeah um like overall i it's I always just think LA is much bigger so there's much more opportunities but there's also so many people so if you go to a casting in LA you know you walk into a waiting room and there's like 50 girls that look exactly like you so it's there's so much competition and it kind of is a minefield it's yeah it's just it's it's hard to navigate um and also I've been super fortunate like I went out there with friends and some friends have like made it and then other friends like haven't and it's really you just can't really tell or like formulate what why somebody has become successful and then why somebody else didn't um but it is I mean it's a weird industry and a weird it's a weird thing to navigate. Yeah, well, to be honest, the, the overriding factor must be right place, right time, and luck. There's nothing to suggest that it's anything else. 
Yes. Other than that, but it's a sort of acceptance. I mean, have you seen people kind of get to the end of their tether with it and just sort of say, you know what, like, Done. I'm not really going to go for this anymore. And, and, and that goes for everything, not just acting, but like even just trying people trying to put themselves out there on social media. Have, have you experienced some people yes. just say, you know what, I'm not going to get in to that kind of showbiz rat race anymore. And I'm just going to try and work on myself and be myself. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I really know anybody that, that I get, I must do know people who have just been like, done and they've left and started something else but so many people yeah they just I think the thing when you decide to go into acting is that you sort of have to dedicate your entire life to it and really have no plan b because if you have a plan b you should probably go for it and and, mm. not, and not pursue acting because it's just there's so much rejection it's very difficult and there's a very small percentage of people, you know, I think it's like 1% or like maybe even 5% of SAG, which are actually working and like making a real living from it. So, yeah. And there's just a lot of people, you know, we hit, I'm sure you've interviewed so many people that have come on that are the small percentage of people that have made a success out of it. And it was make it seem like it's so easy. And you're like, Oh, you know, they auditioned and then they booked something. And then, you know, next thing you know, they're like, they're just continuously working. And it's just really not like the chances of that happening is so slim. Mm. Um, and then we the do- overriding thing is that they all seem very normal in, and, and, and therefore, uh, and it's still, you know, it's obviously yeah. a, a real honor to talk to people on, on the podcast, but it's like, actually, there's n- nothing necessarily like better about anyone famous or who's achieved things than the normal, it, in a weird sort of way, talking to all these people, like who, some of whose music I grew up on or whatever, uh, has made me just think that over, overall, the people that matter in, in your life are not famous people. It's it's normal people because they're famous people are just the same as normal people. And the people who made it are just the, yeah. the same. A lot of the time it's, you know, it's hard work and lucky breaks. Um, but in terms of going forward, like what, like what would you say was the main thing that you learned from your time in LA and what's your kind of plan moving forward? The main thing I learned in LA, um, I don't, oh, it's a tough one. I'm not, I mean, I'm sure there's so many lessons, um, that I've learned from my time there and I don't know if I'll, if I won't ever go back, I think because I, I mean, so much of my moving there was like, I'm going for three months and 11 years later, I'm still there. <laughs> and so much of coming back was like, oh, the pandemic's happened and I'm and I'm stuck here. So now yeah. I'm in England again. So I don't know if I'm completely done with LA. Um, I mean, it is an amazing place in so many ways. I do agree. It is. But I do think it's certain for me, you know, being back here was great because there is a normality that, exists in LA but kind of doesn't like in that you know a certain point if you want to settle down and you know, have a family say it's LA is definitely not the place to date um and also so many people move there for work and pursuing a career they're not necessarily looking for that it happens um but also you can end up with like Peter Pan syndrome there there's no seasons the years go by really quickly <laughs> and before you know it you're like you're doing the same thing and you see people that you know much older and you're like oh this, you just end up in this kind of robotic pattern um why is it not a good place to date <laughs> I would say <laughs> just because everybody goes there for their career. And um, I always argue this point about LA being the worst city in the world today. And people are like, no, New York. I'm like, no, 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 like LA is is legit the worst place. Um, just because everybody is focused on something else and they're not looking, if you want something serious, there are people like you can find, but it's rare. And I also think the ratio of like men to women is is far off. You know, they talk about New York being it's like 
20 women to every one man or something and in LA I'm like it's there's like one you find like one decent guy and then there's like you know like 50 to 100 women that are all really yeah I'm yeah I feel like when I think about the people I know there and my friends that are single thinking about them all now um so the guys that are single who are like great catches don't just don't they're not looking for relationships or anything serious until they're much older because also people sort of wait guys wait until they're like in their 40s to sort of settle down versus like in their 30s and then the women Mm. I've got so many wonderful amazing female friends that are single and they just can't find the equivalent (laughs) Mm, that's weird that's yeah seems yeah. like quite a selfish uh vibe yes. from from people uh and i mean i was kind of thinking that you were going to say it was because you like everybody's so career focused that you go on a date and people are just sort of talking about their plans and their ambitions endlessly rather than just having a chat yeah, yeah i mean that happens <laughs> i mean you go on dates and they just like talk entirely about themselves at you for hours on end about their career their achievements that definitely I've you should read that. uh there's that book i can't remember what it's i think it's like how to win friends and influence people that they did that film off the back of it and i mean you know for anyone listening who wants to know how to win friends and influence people basically the whole 350 pages just amounts to try and be a good listener so why people haven't kind of picked that up and just go on dates or even just when they meet up with friends do that is is beyond me uh but fi- final question um so if you're thinking of going going back to la like when do you reckon that will be and what are you hope what are you hoping to achieve like what's your next biggest kind of ambition the next biggest ambition i guess is this book so writing a book which just is so scary but um also just so challenging and fun and so many things um so that's the biggest next project no, i've forgotten what the question was now um that, that and, was that was the question more that or was less. The question. yeah i was like how did you word it I forgot how you was <laughs> uh, well <laughs> i i tend to i tend to make my questions too long to be honest that is a habit that i'm going to work on uh but uh yeah i i really hope that you managed to get that book done as soon as possible. Uh, you know, not that there's a rush, but uh, because it will be a fascinating yeah. read. Um, and it, I, it'll, yeah, it will definitely explore, I'm imagining many issues that don't kind of get talked about that much in yeah. an age where we're talking about everything, uh, or at least yes. that's supposed well, That's the hope. I mean, the hope is that it, you know, kind of starts a conversation or it has a viewpoint that's different from what already exists. Um, but we'll see so that's the next plan and then just continuing to write and create I think for me is is where I'm going and then in terms of going back to LA I'm not entirely sure I'm you know with the pandemic happening and then ended up back here so many things have just been thrown off and I am still finding my feet in terms of like where do I want to be located Hated. Um, but I'm sure I'll visit at one point when things open up and you know and I'll probably go and spend a few months there whether or not I move back there permanently I, I'm unsure about um, but I mean I'm so fortunate and lucky that I have the opportunity to move around and be in different cities. Do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi Body Clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge, 
and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridland YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.